but certainly no post-game show. If you believe the Rasmussen poll, the alleged leader in this gubernatorial race is Link Chafee, 37%. Caprio, 28%. Robitaille, 25%. I'm sure there's going to be more polling data that will come in the next couple of days that uh, that we'll have to look at. But um, this is a poll that has been kind and not so kind to Link Chafee, former senator. So I'm sure he's feeling pretty good about it. Senator, welcome. Nice to have you. Thank you very much. Yes, the polls have been up and down through the course of this campaign, such as I've never seen before. Mm. But that's a good one. It's like a roller coaster ride, isn't very it? Very much. Half mil you put in today. God almighty. I think we're being outspent two to one. Despite that. It's good because you can't raise any money? No, because uh, Mr. Capro has the Democratic Governors Association. I don't have an independent Governors Association coming in with hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, you had to know that going in. Yes, I did. Do you ever think, what the hell am I doing with our fortune? What am I doing with our family money? Is it worth it? Tell me. Of course, I have those thoughts, but uh, in this case, the future of Rhode Island is at stake, and I love Rhode Island, as does my family, and we all do, and uh, we're in it to be competitive, and unfortunately, we weren't able to raise the money that, that I anticipated, and so, yes, we're contributing what we can to keep it competitive. Aside from the, uh, the Republican or Democratic Governors Associations, and whatever other side 501c3455527 hike organizations that are out there, you, you gotta you gotta at least give credit to the other candidate, candidacies where they were able to, to to raise some dough. You were actually quite candid about the difficulty in raising money early on in this campaign, and so I guess you had to resign yourself to the idea that, for all intents and purposes, some would perceive this as an attempt to purchase the governor's office. No, I'm being outspent. I think two to one, Dan. So, I well, I guess the the difference is the mechanics of of, of traditional First Amendment exercise via fundraise, and your own money in. And don't forget, Mr. Capra was treasurer, uh, dealing with a seven billion dollar pension fund, which needs to be uh, have different vendors. If you just take one percent of that seven billion dollars, that's seventy million dollars worth of business that the treasurer treasurer. Uh, allocates out and as I've said often during the campaign the, and Wall Street Journal uh, has highlighted there was a pay-to-play operation here in Rhode Island where in order to get a piece of that one percent that 70 million you had to contribute to Mr. Capro's campaign so he had a huge uh, campaign war chest comparative to all the other candidates that's mm. that's a fact it was no, uh, no, we no. haven't seen that kind of money raised in this state well, the, uh, the, in a long time. The $2.7 million that he's raised, how much do you attribute to that total, to this pay-to-play allegation that you make? Well, there's 60000 returned. 60000 That was returned. So returned. that was... So that is not net-net. That's returned. That's uh, so bad that it was returned. Yeah, but I, I'm asking you about the money you've put in, and you, uh, you immediately jump to the talking point of a pay-to-play scenario that has been long-winded in this campaign, the truth is, is that it's 60 grand returned. I'm asking you just about, you know, when when you go to bed at night, or you look yourself in the mirror, do you think to yourself, God almighty, oh my God, another half a million dollar check, are you kidding me? Well, that's don't all, forget also, that's all I'm asking. when I got into this race, David Cicilline was running for governor, Patrick Lynch was running for governor, Elizabeth Roberts was running for governor, Frank Caprio was running for governor, and I anticipated a primary in which those Democratic opponents would spend all their money, and uh, from the, going into the general might be a less expensive race. Oops. That didn't that didn't happen. <laughs> what I've said right from the beginning, I'm into Oops. I'm into be competitive and to win. People people wonder, and I only ask because I know people wonder, whose money is it? Your lovely wife's, yours, whose money is it? My wife's uh, family has been successful in business over the years and has been uh, very careful stewards of uh, of what they have made. So it's her money? Yes. Well, that's candid. How does it make you feel? 
Does it bother you? No, we we have a great relationship. Stefan and I have known each other since we were teenagers, so uh, uh, we have great respect and why, uh, why relationship is, that is actually growing stronger all the time. Why is she committed to this? Why, why does she why does she reach in to the reserves the way she does? Uh, Dan, can we talk about the campaign rather than? Of course than we will. But, but this the, is this is believe me, Senator. When you put a half a million dollars of your own family money into a campaign, these are the things that people wonder about. It's a very fair question, and I just thought I'd ask you what her commitment is. What is her vision? Why, it's total. What, what it's is, total. She is in. I'm not asking whether she's committed to you. I'm, what is the commit? What What is the vision? What is the vision that you share? Yesterday she was in Westerly. Today I think she's at some senior centers. Uh, she cares about Rhode Island as much as I do. Okay, tell me what you're here thinking about. Uh, the shove it flap, since it's gotten so much attention. I don't understand it. What do you but mean? I will say that <laughs> the first mean? time I heard it, uh, Mike Trainer called me. And your, camp, your new campaign manager. Yes. Your and former said, deputy campaign manager. Yes, and said that uh, he had just heard on the, Dan, on the um, John DePietro show uh, those quotes. And I, my immediate reaction was, one thing I've learned from the Caprio campaign is they're scripted. And... This had to be scripted, and that, that was my first reaction. This has to be uh, something that they got together and thought about, but that, that was just my first reaction. But other than that, I don't know any more than you do or anybody else does. Well, that it would be scripted means then what to you? Just the reputation this campaign has, of, and I've heard others say it's, everything's focus grouped, that, that the kitchen table I heard earlier in the show, that every opportunity, scripted lines come out, and, and that's just one thing I've learned from campaigning against Mr. Caprio for the last year and a half. And why would this be any different? I, I still don't understand it, though. It just didn't make sense on a beautiful day when the President of the United States is coming to our state, a rare event with lots of media, going to a factory, meeting our citizens, the motorcade, all the excitement. Uh, it, it was perplexing to me. Did you have any involvement at all yesterday in the president's visit? No, I did not. Was there ever any conversation about whether or not you'd, you'd mingle? No. The idea that the president and the White House proffered to a reporter uh, without direct communication to Frank Caprio that there would be no endorsement in this governor's race, which you and your campaign quickly claimed as a victory, um, certainly has grabbed the ire of the Caprio campaign, understandably. Why do you think the president has stayed out in what is unorthodox, no doubt, to leave untended the typical endorsement of the Democratic gubernatorial candidate? Don't forget that the Caprio cam campaign initially characterized this as a victory for them, in that since I had helped candidate Obama as co-chair of Republicans and Independents for Obama in 2008, that I didn't get the endorsement was a victory for them. But that quickly changed in the morning on the John DePietro show. <laughs> Understood. But that was what I read in the paper that morning, that the campaign spokesman was characterizing this as uh, a partial were, were, victory were for you, them, and were, that, sure. that I could see how they would spin it that way. Were you or anybody else working the White House to just <laughs> stay away? No, I made one phone call when I first heard, along with all Rhode Islanders, that President Obama was coming to Rhode Island. What was that, a week and a half ago? Whatever it was. Yeah, it's been a few weeks ago. A few yeah. weeks. Uh, one call to a fellow in the White House who had helped me when I was campaigning uh, for candidate Obama uh, and said, you know, is there anything I need to know about an endorsement? And if so, just give me a heads up. And he said, we will. And that was it. And there was no heads up. Uh, but he he would have told me if there was going to be an endorsement, and there wasn't. Well, what endorsement were you asking about, your own or Caprio's? Either one. I was more worried about endorsement for Caprio, we'll say. Sure. And why were you worried? I had helped. I had gone to Florida. I'd gone to Ohio on behalf of Senator Obama. Uh, I'd gone to Michigan, New Hampshire. I'd, I'd, and... Uh, I understand how politics works, and I understood the Democratic Governors Association would be on him like a ton of bricks and just give me a heads up. What do you think it says about the president that he attempted to stay neutral in this? 
I think it was a good decision. I mean, he was in here for the congressional delegation, and that affects his agenda more than a governor's race. And I know the pressure he was under. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine. Uh, but uh, I had stepped forward at a time to help him, and uh, I, I wrote an op-ed about the Iraq war votes, uh, calling out Hillary Clinton when she voted for the first uh, amendment before uh, the war vote. There were two votes that night, and she had voted against the 11th Amendment, which was for diplomacy. I wrote an op-ed on that. That was very favorable to the Obama campaign. Link Chaffee's in the studio. The, the uh, campaign, yours, quickly turns around an ad. I don't know if we're, uh, if we've, uh, Tony, have we, have we found that ad yet? I know you're on the phone. Do, 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 have, do we have that ad? Uh, let's, let's, let's run this TV ad that is uh, quickly turned around since the president arrived here. Real change isn't voting for George Bush's war in Iraq. I knew what it was. Lincoln Chafee knew what it was. You were voting for war. That's why I oppose this war. Link opposed this war. And if Lincoln Chafee could stand up. And that's the kind of uh, leader Link Chafee is. His honesty and his integrity and his willingness to stand up even when it isn't in his own okay. political so, so interest. So that is the TV itself. version. By the way, the uh, audio is from the president during his campaign. And Mayor Bloomberg. And Mayor Bloomberg. Thank you. Uh, we'll talk about Mayor Bloomberg in a second. Some would say the quick turnaround on that ad um, is either deft technological and creative work and or you knew this whole thing uh, was going to play out this way and you were ready. Which one is it? It's the former. And that, as you can tell from the audio there, that day in 2008, in the spring of 2008, at the Rhode Island College Auditorium, absolutely packed auditorium on behalf of uh, candidate Obama. And when he said those words, and you can hear the, the ovation, he mentioned my name and the ovation, it was, it was very, very memorable. And then when we saw it on YouTube, we always wanted to use that clip as an ad. It's, 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 a, it's a great clip. And we were thinking of that before President Obama ever thought of coming here, and certainly before we ever heard uh, shove it. 